So what is going on guys, it's your boy Nistro here and we are back with what should have been a mix between your Sarctic and Drytron seems to be leaning entirely towards Drytron. When your Sarctic's got its last wave of support, we got the Ursatron, which Ursatron is both a your Sarctic and a Drytron card and adds any your Sarctic or Drytron spell and trap from deck to hand. So you would think they would mix a little better Initially, I was a little pissed off because all of these new Drytron cards, none of them say the word your Sarctic on there. And I thought, wow, I really hate this because now your Sarctics are not getting more support. It seems like they're only focusing on Drytron. Last time that your Sarctics got support, at least they got one card that was joint supported. Now it's because you can clearly tell by the artworks, both new to and of Alpha Draconis, that these are fusing the Sarctics and Drytrons together and yet your Sarctics are nowhere in the picture. Neither of these count as both your Sarctics or Drytron. New 2 does not work with both a Drytrons and your Sarctics, it only works with Drytron. These cards were met with a lot of criticism and rightfully so because they lock you out of being able to ritual summon non-machine monsters for the turn, which means stuff like Cyber Angel Benten or even your Herald of Perfections, if in case you still wanted to use those in Drytron, would not be possible if you resolved new two to either summon itself or to search. And now that we have this new ritual that says negate on it, this doesn't seem to do enough for the deck to warrant the sacrificing of other potential ritual archetypes like Cyber Angels. And I just have to be a, a bit of a contrarian here and say that Drytrons are just a really stupid deck if they're unchecked. The Cyber Angel Natasha loops and the just amount of just gas that they get is just completely stupid. It's basically FTK going second. It's basically breaking through so many negates. It's breaking so many boards with Cyber Angel Natasha if you don't make enough negates against them. So it's really hard to like actually balance Drytron because if you give them too much, they can go too crazy and if you give them too little they can't do enough so it's a fine line you have to balance and i think starting with giving drytron more drytron focused cards that are like within its own engine other than trying to reach into other ritual engines i think that might be a good start into making this a more balanced archetype i can't say for sure whether this will be good drytron support or not but as it turns out ironically drytron new 2 is actually the perfect card for your sarctics because your sarctics needed more cards that start their turn and that has been an issue for a long time even with the Yersarctic Earthbound video that I made earlier this year the Yersarctic stuff and the Earthbound stuff when put together they synergize pretty well but the engines cannot actually dig into each other and that's the biggest thing there is still a consistency issue because if you open only Earthbound support cards you're not getting into the your Sarctic side of things. And if you only open the your Sarctic support, there's maybe a small chance you might be able to get into the Earthbound support, but there's no like direct line into it for one way or the other, like going either way. It's like you, you kind of just had to hope that you open both in the same hand to make the most out of it. But you played enough starters of each to where I would say six to seven out of 10 hands, you should be drawing like joint supported hands. Now, I think although we won't be able to utilize the Earthbound stuff in this variant, because of the Drytron Exceed monster, Drytron Move Beta Fafnir, Move Beta Fafnir actually can just mill New 2 from deck to graveyard. And by milling New 2 from deck to graveyard, New 2 can actually just summon itself, search a Drytron. And that actually gives us full combo. So the question now is what potential level one engines are there to get us into move beta fafnir and i've done some diligent research on this and um, i've come to a few conclusions the very first being the heroic challenger morningstar morningstar on summon can search the heroic envoy and heroic envoy can search the knuckle knife or knuckle sword it's now named so knuckle sword can summon itself and make the morningstar level one so that actually works out perfectly now you have two level ones boom that's your engine issues with the engine is that you have to open morningstar if you only open envoy morningstar cannot dig into knuckle sword directly it can only dig into heroic envoy it's not the most consistent combo right because now that's only three ways into it next we have dd Savin kepler right uh if you watch my tg video you you, you may be familiar with kepler kepler 
on Summon can search Dark Contract, and Dark Contract on Summon can search Lamia, and Lamia can send Dark Contract to Summon itself, and now you have two level ones, which also happen to be tuner plus non-tuner. It works out pretty well, but it's the same issue where like you have to open Kepler. You can't just open Gate and search either Kepler or Lamia. It's like, it has to be Kepler, which searches Gate, which searches Lamia. Just like the heroic combo, you only have three ways into two level ones. Oh, I guess four ways if you're playing one for one. The next line is Rescue Cat. So Rescue Cat can tribute itself, summon two level one beasts from your deck right? Or it's level three or lower, but we're going to be using it to summon level ones. And I think the best level one beast type that could work in your Sark deck is Yoko Tuner. So Yoko Tuner is pretty interesting because uh, on normal summon, he could summon out any tuner from hand or graveyard, which means when you're discarding a lot of those level eight tuners, he can revive them back pretty much for free, but their effects are negated, meaning they won't be able to trigger to like remove things from like field or to banish things from graveyard. Purely be just to get the extra body to go into either Septentrion or into Polari easier. You'd kind of have to raw dog three cat, three Yoko tuner, and it wouldn't suck to draw the Yoko tuner by itself. So that's why I thought it could have been an interesting route. All things considered, the best possible route to go for with Two level ones would still have to be heroic charm and morning star because heroics are the fucking best archetype right like clearly that's undebated but there is one more option and that is snake eyes clearly snake eyes is the you know talk of the town right now it's fire format it's the best deck by a long shot i'm sure everyone can tell where this is going now we're not going to be playing any complex link combos in this route but you normal summon Snake Eye Ash, and Snake Eye Ash gives you access to the entire engine thanks to Snake Eye Poplar, which is able to uh, search a Snake Eye spell or trap card from deck to hand when summoned. On top of Snake Eye Ash being able to tribute itself and another card, well, it sends, but you know, same, same difference, and summon out Snake Eye's Flameberg from deck, from hand or deck. Now, the reason why I kind of like this line better is because one, if Flameberg is tributed from hand, it actually, Flameberg is tributed from hand for your, your, your Sarctic monsters. It actually gets to summon back to two level ones. It still gets to trigger its graveyard effect. Worst case, even if you don't have the two level ones because you decided to put Poplar on face up field, once you send Poplar to the graveyard for something else, like let's say Poplar gets removed, then you can trigger Poplar placed to Flameberg and then Flameberg can be there for like, if, when you send it to the graveyard, then it could bring back the two level ones. On top of being able to give you access to Flameberg, it also gives you a lot of interesting Snake Eye Spawn Trap cards, some of which aren't even being talked about right now. One of them being Simple Spells of Subversion, which was one that initially had a lot of hype, but didn't really see a lot of follow through. Not a lot of people were using this card because um, A, in the mirror match, this is kind of redundant because if your opponent has Temple, they can just summon back the monster, or if you're targeting something like Flameberg, they can just target the other monster. Like, they can just chain Flameberg to summon something back from Spell and Trap Zone onto their field. So it's not that effective against Snake Eye in the mirror match. Against a lot of other decks, this could be really effective, right? Because this allows Flameberg to like pivot between more options as to what to summon from your opponent's field. But in a typical combo, we're using our two level ones to overlay into a Drytron Exceed. So this is more for just removing monsters. And maybe if, you know, Snake Eyes gets hit, however it gets hit, maybe this card may, might not be as relevant as some of our other options. The second option being Dramatic Snake Eye Chase, and this one is very interesting, and this is one that I've kind of been messing around with a bit in like Rescue Ace and in some other more budget decks because this is kind of just another variant of Wanted Poster, except instead of going into combo, it gets you into interruptions. So it's a free card that essentially gets you a Omni with Diabell Star, or it could potentially even get you into a something of an anti spell. And what do I mean? Dramatic Snake Eye Chase can place Diabell Star from hand deck or graveyard face up in the spell and trap zone as a continuous spell. Then, during end phase, you can banish this card from graveyard, target a monster, treat it as a continuous spell in your spell and trap zone, and then special summon it. Even if Poplar was in spell and trap zone, like let's say you've already like summoned Diabell Star or something 
and this is just happens to be engraved, it could also summon out the pop bar, but nine times out of 10, I think 10 times out of 10, you always go for summon the Abel star. And this is really interesting because it plays around Nibiru, it's very likely that they've used up all their hand traps by the time that this second effect resolves. So the Abel star just gets to summon itself and then place any Sinful Spoils Spoiler Trap from your deck face down. And the most interesting of those options for Dia Balstar being Sinful Spoils of Betrayal Silvera, and Silvera gets to send Dia Balstar to target a face-up card on field, negate its effects. If it's a continuous spell or a field spell, its effects are negated permanently. It also has a cool graveyard effect that may not come up often, but may be pretty big if it does come up, where if your opponent activates something in response to a Sinful Spoils, Speller Trap or into a Dia Star monster effect, and this is in Graveyard, you can banish it from Grave, negate that effect. So that's actually pretty cool. The second option is your Simple Spoils Cycle, which is going to be coming out in Legacy of Destruction. And, like, and this allows you to take a level five or higher illusion monster, either add it to your hand or special summon it. But if it's summoned this way, its effects cannot be activated during, the, during this main phase. It also has another effect engraved but it's not as relevant what level five or higher illusion would we be summoning uh, this card had a lot of hype when it got initially revealed and that is uh dia bells of the original sin so dia bells basically gets to summon itself from hand if a simple spoils card is you know in the graveyard which it will be because you resolve simple spoils cycle to search this but when it's on field because simple spoils cycle does have the ability to just straight up summon it from deck while it's on field, your opponent cannot activate spell or trap cards that were not set. So effectively, it's effectively a mini anti-spell fragrance. So they cannot resolve any quick play spells or traps while Dia Bells is on field. They would have to chain all of them to the cycle because once she's on field, quick play spells would not be able to be activated for the rest of that turn. And then there's the other effect where if either player sets a spell or trap card to the field while this monster is on field, you can target one card you control and one card your opponent controls and pop them both. So she kind of just becomes like, well, you have to set. And then once you set, I can actually force to pop. And then she can pop Dia Bellstar. And then Dia Bellstar, when it's sent to graveyard during your opponent's turn, it can summon itself back. And the beautiful thing about that is that if you have Poplar in Spell and Trap Zone, uh, Dia Bellstar can send Poplar and summon itself back, and then Poplar can trigger to chain block Dia Bellstar's effect. So Dia Bellstar would be chain link one to reset, and Poplar could be chain link two, place itself back in the Spell and Trap Zone. So that's why this is a really interesting line for your Sarctics. And Dia Bellstar herself is level seven or higher. She can also be attributed to summon out your, your Sarctic monsters. And Dramatic Sink Eye Chase can place Dia Bellstar from graveyard. So even if Dia Bellstar gets wasted, she's still useful in the graveyard because of this spell card. So it's a very interesting approach to playing a your Sarctic deck. And before, there was no real line that got you from Snake Eyes into your Sarctic. If there was, you would have seen me make a Snake Eye your Sarctic deck, but it was brought to my attention by a good uh, supporter of mine that Mubeta Fafnir is now full combo. And I just had to see what this really meant for the deck and access to the Snake Eye package even if it's potentially bound to get hit on the ban list, could be really interesting. Let's get into some combos. So with this combo, it really just takes Snake Eye Ash plus any other card in hand. I just happen to use Mega Polar because I don't want the card to actually be like relevant to the combo. So basically Ash plus any other card in hand. Some of the Ash, Ash searches Poplar. We've seen this before. This time, Poplar is going to search the Dramatic Snake Eye Chase, like we were just talking about earlier. Overlay into Move Beta Fafnir. Move Beta Fafnir gets to mill Drytron New 2. Um, you're crying if they have a Drytron right now. I mean, if they have a Bist deal right now, excuse me. New 2 triggers in Graveyard, can summon itself. That's probably when they would uh, Bist deal you. And then uh, if not, it gets to summon itself and then search a Drytron monster from deck to hand. And because our ultimate Bright Knight, Ursatron Alpha, is always treated as a Drytron card, he's able to be searched. And then we can summon him with his own effect. And all in one effect, he summons himself and he searches a Yersarctic spell card. So we get to search for Departure. So Departure basically gives us access to the entire Yersarctic engine. 
Now we're linking off into SP potentially to play around a Nibiru, right? Because we were under threat of Nibiru after the Ursatron Alpha effect. So after Ursatron Alpha was summoned and Departure was placed on field, that's when we were under threat of Nibiru. Before we go into our Yersarctic engine where we're locked out of summoning any sort of Lynx or Xyz, I think it's safer to go for something like a SP Little Knight. So now uh, we get to go for Poplar because uh, Moobator Fafnir was sent to Graveyard for Link Summon. We're gonna use Departure, drop one, search two. It really doesn't matter which two you search here if you already have Alpha on field. If, let's say you got nibbed and like SP plus Alpha is like banished at the moment, then you're gonna need another level seven or higher in hand to resolve this, but it's fine. You get to go summon out Mega Tannis and then Dark Synchro off into your Sarctic Polari. Polari is going to trigger to place your field spell. Polari has an effect where it can tribute a level seven or higher monster to either summon or add to hand a your Sarctic monster from your graveyard. And thanks to Big Dipper, it can substitute the cost by banishing a level seven or higher Sarctic monster instead of paying cost. So we banish whoever and we summon back one of our level eights, which is Mega Polar. Uh, and then we get to go into Septentrion. And I know it seems a little redundant to have SP on field if Septentrion's going to get negated. I mean, if SP is going to get negated anyway by Septentrion, but it's better just to have that little bit of protection for that first part of the turn, or to even have that removal for that first part of the turn than it is to just not have it at all. So now we're gonna activate a Dramatic Snake Eye Chase, and this is gonna allow us to place Dia Balstar from deck on, on end phase. Dramatic Snake Eye Chase summons Dia Bellstar. Dia Bellstar gets to set the Simple Spoils of Betrayal from deck. And now we have an Omni and we have a Floodgate for monsters summoned from extra deck. Links or Exceed summoned from extra deck, effects are negated. It doesn't matter whose side of field it's on, any Link, any Exceed, effect is negated. It's also a pretty cool thing with Big Dipper is that when it gets to seven counters, if you aren't familiar, every time a monster is special summoned, either from you or your opponent, it gets a counter. When there's seven or more counters on this card and you control a Yersarctic Synchro, when a monster is special summoned, you can remove all counters from this card to target a monster your opponent controls and take control of it. So you kind of want to get to Polari as soon as possible in your turn, however that may be, so that you can get the most counters on Big Dipper possible as well, and so that Big Dipper can start stealing monsters. Your opponent controls and this this can trigger when whenever a monster is special even your own right so as you're gonna see here really soon all right so let's say they normal summon right we get to silvera on their normal summon their effects are negated permanently now once the abel star sent to the graveyard it triggers it gets to send any card from hand to grave it, and it actually doesn't have to be face up it, it doesn't have to be face up field it could be any card from field uh to summon itself back and then Dipper will get a counter, Diabell Starver trigger, and Poplar will chain block to place itself back into Bone Trap Zone. And now we get to set another Simple Spells trap from deck. And let's say they have a special summon, right? Like let's say they special summon a monster, then Septentrion can trigger. Septentrion can search any Yersarctic card from deck to hand. It doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a Yersarctic monster. It could be any Yersarctic card. And I like Megatanis here because Megatanis can summon itself for the cost of having to tribute level seven or higher, it can be substituted by either Departure or by Big Dipper. It doesn't really matter which one, but Departure is easier to use because Departure is free. Big Dipper, you'd have to banish one from Graveyard instead. So you use Departure here to substitute the cost, summon out Mega Tannis. Mega Tannis on trigger gets to book a Moon Monster your opponent controls. So that's sort of like two interruptions plus a floodgate, plus potentially another interruption off Big Dipper. If one more monster would be special summoned, I would get to steal any monster my opponent controls. By Book of Mooning their monster, it now makes them harder to like out something like my Big Dipper or out the Septentrion. Back when your Sarctics and Drytron first started getting joint support, there was a fusion that came out called uh, Ultimate Flagship Ursatron, and this card has just never really been viable. It's never really been able to be utilized, not because it's a bad fusion, but because it's basically impossible to summon within the context of a normal Yersarctic turn, because Yersarctic was already in inconsistent enough as it is, 
and Drytron didn't really need this card because it was just, it just doesn't do enough for Drytron. The fusion spell being the Yersarctic Drytron, which is just the names of both archetypes, has a very awkward summoning condition. It gets to summon out the flagship from your extra deck by banishing both the Yersarctic field spell, which is Big Dipper, and the Drytron field spell, which is Fafnir from hand or field only, and the fact that it, it was only from hand or field made it really awkward, which meant like you had to open both field spells to just resolve this initially. But if you have Polari or if you have the Drytron Alpha Thuban, which is a very random Drytron monster, it's not even like, I almost thought this said Fafnir at first, because if, if it was like, okay, you have the your Sarctic starter and you have like the Drytron Xyz on field, then you get to substitute the cost. But it's not even that, it's like a random Drytron, which just, it just doesn't do much by itself. So it's not even worth playing in your, your Sarctic list. Your Sarctic Drytron, if you control one of those two monsters, allows you to banish one of the field spells from deck instead. Meaning you did still have to have one of the, your Sarctic Big Dipper or the Drytron Fafnir either on field or in hand. The big issue with that is that more often than not, banishing the Yersarctic field spell is like getting rid of one potential interruption. Whereas like the Drytron field spell doesn't really do much after it's um, activated. Like on activation, it searches and then that's really it. That's all it really cares about. But the Yersarctic field spell is more of a slow burn. It gives Yersarctic uh, cost substitutions and it, it could potentially become a really significant disruption. By activating your Sarctic Drytron, you're sacrificing all the potential with this card simply to summon out this fusion monster, which very frankly is not worth sacrificing the field spell. Because all the fusion really does is add back banished your Sarctic or Drytron monsters and searches more your Sarctic and Drytron monsters. So you're kind of like just doing more of the same thing. It, you're, you're sacrificing potential uh, game winning activations for something that just gets you more resources. And that's inherently difficult to summon. It's not built to give you back what you lost to make it. At least with Septentrion and with a lot of the Yersarctic cards, they may be high cost, but Septentrion actually gets you back something that's worth sacrificing all those monsters to make it. That's why flagship Ursatron has been kind of shaky because it's inconsistent, sucks away field spells, and it just isn't really worth the high cost. There's no other way to make this card other than with your Sarkic Drytron, which is another issue. That's why this card has been a hard bargain since its conception. But I think now there may be an argument that it is worth a shot in your Sarkic list simply because of how much you're getting off of the Snake Eye and Drytron parts of the deck. So let's say you go into the normal combo with Snake Eyes. You go Ash, Poplar, Poplar, get you Chase, Fafnir, Fafnir, Mill, New 2, New 2 summon itself back. Add Ursatron Alpha. Let's say that you've already opened the Yersarctic Departure and that Ursatron does not actually need to search Departure, what would be your next best target? It might be Radiation, which Radiation is a really solid card, but let's just dabble in the idea that uh, Yersarctic Drytron is a viable option. Let's see what Yersarctic Drytron can actually net us in terms of combo potential. So. You still summon Ursatron, we search Departure, right? And you Departure here, and again, it really doesn't matter which two your Sarktics that you search, just make sure one of them is one of the level eights. And before you go for the your Sarktic summons, because it's after you activate their effects to summon themselves from hand, that you're locked into summoning only monsters with a level for the rest of the turn, you could go into something like Codebreaker Virus Swordsman. Like, you're not scared of Nib? You go into Virus Swordsman, you can also go into other potential links, like you could turn New 2 into Link Rebo, go into Dark, you can go Azalea, steal that monster your opponent controls to your field. 
on summon pop a card on field. It does also pop itself if you have three or less spells in graveyard, which isn't that big of a deal because we're not really gonna be using it anyway. You could also go Cleave for Genius, both you know, new two and new beta Fafnir are machines. You could potentially negate a voiceless voice, continuous speller trap or something of that nature with Cleave for Genius if you don't feel like going into SP, but if you just want the damage, you can go Virus Swordsman. Another thing you can do is you can just swing with the new beta Fafnir and the new two, nothing stopping you from attacking with all three of these monsters. You know, then you can go main phase two or relate to Zeus, Zeus to board, and then resolve your Yersarctic departure. That's another option as well for, for going second. So it really just depends on your situation, but Virus Swordsman's cool. He doesn't really care about any on field effects. And then if he's destroyed, by an opponent's card during end phase, he gets to summon himself back, but he's banished when he leaves field, which is cool, right? Like just a little bit of a uh, floating. So now let's say, okay, we're going for Virus Swordsman, Poplar comes back. Now we're going for our Mega Billis. We go Polari, Polari places field spell. And that's another frustrating thing is like placing the field spell from from deck like not being able to add it to hand is kind of tough because now it's like you're you're just not going to have a field spell if polari allowed us to search another copy of field spell and you already hard opened one then maybe it might be better but just not being able to get access to field spell at all kind of tough uh there's also an argument where if you open fafnir and like you activate fafnir to search your sarctic drytron by having fafnir on field after summoning polari if Polari added Big Dipper from deck to hand, you could potentially play just double Big Dipper, banish one from deck, and then summon out the Alpha Ursatron. But because it places Big Dipper on field, it cannot search for Big Dipper on top of being able to banish Big Dipper for your Sarkta Drytron. It has to be either you banish the Big Dipper that you place on field or nothing, or you banish it from deck, which is really tough. We're gonna resolve Polari's effect to uh, summon one from grave. We're gonna use Big Dipper as a cost substitution. And the one that we're gonna summon now this time is your Sarctic McPolar. And the reason why we're summoning a McPolar is because we're gonna need more bodies after we go for our Ursatron. So now uh, we're gonna use your Sarctic Drytron, banish Fafnir, banish Big Dipper, because we've already used the, subs the cost substitution. It's basically the best that we can do with Big Dipper before we can sacrifice it and summon out our flagship. And once flagship's on board, we're gonna wanna use some extenders. And yes, Drytron, unlike Departure, your Sarctic Drytron can be attributed as to substitute a cost of your Sarctic or Drytron, the turn that is sent to Graveyard, but it's a hard once per turn on that, on that effect. What's funny is that the fusion summoning effect is not a hard once per turn, but you're never doing that more than once, like ever. So now you get to summon out any level eight Yersarctic from hand for free, basically the one that you search off of McPolar. And now because a monster is special summoned, you get to search another Yersarctic from deck to hand. Now you get to go for Polar Star and Polar Star. Uh, if you watch my other Yersarctic video, you know that Polar Star contribute itself and another uh, level eight or higher your Sarctic monster to summon out a your Sarctic synchro, ignoring its summoning conditions, which isn't really a big deal because they can't be summoned back from anywhere anyway. They have to be ignoring summoning conditions. And you can go for Septentrion. Now, the interesting thing about Polar Star is that Polar Star turns Septentrion into only negating links and exceeds into being a floodgate for anything summoned from extra deck because Polar Star's final effect is that anything summoned using its effect allows that synchro to also stop your opponent from activating the effects of monsters with a level that were summoned from extra deck. So because we attributed Polar Star to summon out Septentrion, it doesn't just negate links and exceeds. Now synchros, fusions, and uh, even pendulum summoned from extra deck cannot activate their effects while face up on field. And now we activate the dramatic chase and it's the same difference, right? So now we have a Septentrion with one more form of being a Floodgate. And we still have the Omni with the Silvera. And now Dia when Dia Bellstar is summoned, this, this is real interesting because Flagship also triggers. And again, Poplar can chain block the whole chain link. So Flagship gets to search any Yersarctic. And then Dia Bellstar gets to set 
um, either cycle or subversion, whatever secondary sinful spoils spell or trap that you want to use. And I did kind of goof in the bomb build because I used both of my Megatannises. I should have searched any other level eight instead of my second Mega Megatannis. In this scenario, like, yeah, maybe Mega Puller might be cool, but you may want to go for Megatannis to like stop them from summoning more monsters. Even though everything from extra deck is negated, there are still things like Fenrir that can potentially, you know, mess you up. And I also uh, failed to use Ursatron's ignition effect, where once per turn it could target one of my banished Drytron or your Sarctic monsters and add them to hand, so I could have added back Ursatron or New 2 for follow up next turn. That would have been great. That would have actually been a really strong way to utilize Ursatron Alpha to uh, dig me for more follow up on, on the following turn. So it's definitely interesting how much more consistent your Sarctic is and how much more access to stronger engines like Snake Eyes slash Simple Spoils because of this new Drytron support. It creates a line between one of the strongest archetypes in the game and your Sarctics. All right, guys, so getting into the deck profile, we got triple Snake Eye Ash, two Poplar, two Diabell Star. You could bump her up to three and cut Flameberg if you wanted to. I just like the utility of Flameberg in this deck, and I know after seeing my last video, seeing this card in the list is kind of crazy but if it's still gonna be here by the time infinite forbidden comes out you might as well fucking use it right use it while while it's still here i have the same philosophy with everything that's broken in Yu-Gi-Oh. like use it while it's available unless it's like stupid expensive then fuck it but otherwise double alpha ursatron i don't think you need this card of three it's not a starter but it works really well with the Yersarctic engine if you open, as I've mentioned before, if you open like McPolar, this is a great card to like make McPolar a sort of 1.5 card starter because now McPolar can discard anything, add Ursatron, Ursatron, add Departure, then you kind of have full combo. Or you can add Slider, personal preference. And then I like to do two ofs of each of the level eights. So double Mega Tannis, double Mega Polar, double Mega Billis. And they all have their own utility, right? So Mega Tannis, Book of Moons, Mega Polar, and MSTs and then Mega Bills can banish one. It basically DD Crows. It does suck that they are like trigger effects on summon and not, it's not like it would be a lot better if the entire thing was like one effect. Like you tribute, you summon, then you activate the effect. The the second effect, if you control a, a, your Sarctic, kind of like how Alpha Ursatron has it as one effect to summon itself and then search, it, it would be a lot better if the your Sarctic had like just one effect to summon and then do the thing and then book a moon or to summon and then MST. I feel like that would make these cards a lot better, but they're not terrible as they are now. And they are kind of essential uh, to getting into your higher level, your Sarctic synchros. It's really like a necessary evil to play the level eights. Triple McPolar. McPolar searches on summon. Single McTannis. McTannis is great. Like if you open this plus Ursatron, it's like, you can tribute Ursatron, add Ursatron back. It basically, you don't go minus one to summon this card because you can add back uh, your Sarctic level eight tuner if that's what you use to summon him. It's definitely not staple by any means and it is cuttable if you feel like you have enough engine in the deck, but I just like playing it at one just to have like the extra body. The single new two, I don't think you should be playing this card at multiple copies. It's basically a soft brick. The whole idea is that you're gonna be milling this card with move beta Fafnir and your level one lines. So I don't think you should be playing this at multiple copies, but yeah. Triple Departure, Radiation, Slider, Big Dipper. If you're gonna be playing the Yersarctic Drytron stuff, which you see at the end here, which this stuff is cuttable, this is nowhere near staple territory. You can bump this up to two and just resolve it with your second Polari. If, if that's really how you want to go about it. But if, you, if you're not going to play the uh, flagship, then you can just play the single Big Dipper. It works fine. If it gets removed from field, is what it is. One original Simful, double Snake Eye Dramatic Chase, only because Poplar makes this card really convenient. Being able to hard draw Dia Bellstar and still be able to tribute to summon like our, your Sarctics and then be, still be able to activate this card to place the Diabell Star, either from Grave or from Deck, is pretty cool. Silvera, because it's our Omni Negate. We got our nine hand trap slots, our one call by, so like 10 non engine slots. And if you cut down the Fafnir and the Drytron, you'd be at 41 cards. You could play Wanted if you wanted to, but I feel like 
that would just make the deck too expensive and like not worth it. Also, because you're not really trying too hard to go. You'd rather open Snake Eye Ash. So I think like one for one and bonfires would be better in this deck rather than trying to go for wanteds because you don't want to because you want to save your Diabell Star for setting up the Silvera rather than setting up the Snake Eye package and you'd much rather discard Diabell Star for your your Sarkdix than use it to get into to get you into Snake Eye Ash but you know you got to do what you got to do if if you have no other option then yes Diabell Star can still go for Original Sinful place down Snake Eye Ash you could play Diabell Star at three if you wanted to. Wanted's are not a staple by any means. Not saying that they're bad either. You could in theory play triple wanted and cut dramatic chase down to one, but for the way that we're using Diabell Star, it's better to get her off of Snake Eye Dramatic Chase. It's it's stronger against hand traps when we play the deck this way. Extra deck, you got double Satentry on one Grand Chariot. I don't think you're gonna make two in a game. Personally, you can cut this down to one if you wanted to, but Yu-Gi-Oh sure is a game sometimes, so it's really like personal preference the one chariot because it's like a glider beast gazaris on summon it gets to pop two cards on field and then it can protect like field spell from being targeted from some from stuff like cosmic or like sp you got polar star to set up like your full floodgated septentrion polaria two you could bump this down to one but i think it really works well at two for just bringing you back some of your higher level your sarctic monsters i think it's just a good like pivot card for the deck just to keep around baron because it's just too good not to play it if you play with with this and like the two level one snake eyes you just have them on field you can just any level eight plus two level ones equals baron move beta fafnir right zeus if you're not gonna play the flagship stuff like if you don't want to play your to drytron and fafnir you could also play down nerd because nothing stopping move beta fafnir from just swinging at the opponent so you like you go move beta fafnir swing overlay into down nerd overlay into zeus Zeus wipe the board, uh, that's how you want to go for it. And you'd have like double Zeus wipe. SP for getting rid of bodies or like problematic cards. Codebreaker Virus Swordsman if you just want something to do with your bodies that isn't just in like a going first situation because it can like summon itself back from grave if it's destroyed. Azalea for the same reason as like SP, right? If you just want to pop stuff, like you don't really care about having the extra body. Like maybe if you feel like you need the zones, then you maybe go Azalea instead of SP. Both have their utility, right? And also you don't have to waste your SP earlier. So it's like you use Azalea to pop something like insignificant and then like maybe turn three, if you still need something like SP to get rid of more cards on field, it's still an option. Whereas like Azalea is only an option if you're going into it with the Drytron Fafnir plus new two. And then we got super poly targets. We have our flex spot, which is the flagship Ursatron. And I think like playing multiple copies of all the Yersarctic cards is also flex spots. So I, I guess we have three flex spots instead of uh, just one. A side deck, we got more hand traps, super polys, tactics, Phantasme, because it's really good against Snake Eyes, and this could be Fenrir as well, but I just feel like more hand traps that are level 7 or higher would, would be a better call. But I'm not objected to the idea of Unicorn or Fenrir in this deck. I just think Phantasme is a lot stronger. Like, I kind of, like, drifted away from Unicorn only because McPolar does not get its effect on Normal Summon, it's only on Special Summon. Unicorn would not be effective in, like, Special Summon Unicorn, no Normal Summon McPolar, that doesn't get you anything. If it did, then yes, I would still be playing Unicorn, but because it doesn't, it, it's just, it has no place in the list. Fenrir is just the better card, or the stronger card, I should say. As I said, you could play Fenrir if you want to, but Fa Phantasma is also an option. And then we have like our Kurikaras, so like turn three, if you want to use our original Simful, or if we have like a leftover Snake Eye Ash, you can search like curry car to get rid of any problematic monsters your opponent may have that are like still activating their effects even under septentrion and kind of just like make it easier to go for game and then uh subversion because you know for going second pop lark and search this instead of dramatic snake eye chase and make it make the deck a little more aggressive against the opponent and you know shout outs to dia bells and simple spoil cycle these cards are interesting it's just they can be sometimes a little too slow because you cannot actually use the full part of dia bells is um anti-spell type effect if you summon her off of cycle so that's that's like the one little issue but otherwise it's it's not a bad resource to get off of just summoning Diabell Star, which you're probably going to be doing anyway. 
it's really personal preference. There are probably better cards you could be playing, but the, the these last four cards are just like whatever, you know, like the first 15 are what's most important. And yeah, uh, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below about uh, the new Drytron support or about like just your Sarctic in general. This has been your boy Nistro here, signing out, peace.